Amen. Amen, church. You may take a seat. This is why we're here this morning is to bless the name of the Lord. Whether you came happy or hurting or somewhere in between, we're here to bless his name. Amen. I'm Christy Smith, and I'm the director of women's ministry here, and it's a joy and privilege to welcome you always. And I don't only want you to feel welcomed, but I want you to feel cared for. And if this is your first time visiting, we would love to connect with you. And you can help us do that by texting the word welcome to 44322. You can ask any questions, request prayer, anything like that. But we want to just come alongside you wherever you are in your spiritual journey, because we want this place to feel like home to you. So also today, if you've been visiting for a little bit, a while, and want to learn more about our church, today, right after the 11 o'clock service, is the Make It Your Church orientation. It'll be right here uh, out into the Fellowship Center. It's a free lunch. You're going to hear from staff members. You can learn more about what it means to be a member of our church, how to be baptized, how to serve, so you can start that process. So I just want to personally invite you, if that's you, go ahead and make an effort to be there. It'll be very worth your time. Church, everything we do is about discipleship here, about becoming more like Jesus, growing stronger in our walk with him. And so we have something special coming up this Friday, April 12th, for our married uh, young adults, married adults and parents called Stronger. And author and speaker Justin Early is going to be coming here. And Justin has written a book called Habits of the Household. And he talks about just establishing godly rhythms in our family, in our marriages, in our parenting. And don't we want to do that? And so I just make an effort to be here Friday for that. And then for the ladies in the room, the next Thursday, April 18th, we have something called The Gathering. And this is a night of discipleship for women of all ages and stages. We're gonna be focusing on the attributes of God and how our identity is defined by Him. And so for both Stronger and The Gathering, you can look in your message notes and you can register by scanning the QR code. So we would love for you to do that. We'd love for you just to make an effort to be there. We wanna gather as a body and just get stronger in our walk with Jesus. And so all of these things are made possible, church, by your ongoing generosity. We're so grateful for your commitment to worship the Lord through giving. And so if you're not a part of that yet, I'd like to invite you to jump in and do that. You can do that by texting the word GIVE to 44322. You can grab a generosity envelope in your seat back in front of you. Um, You can scan the QR code on the screen. But we're just so grateful to you for your commitment because we want to be a church that not only believes in Jesus, but follows Jesus with our whole hearts. And so now I would like to hand it over to our missions pastor, Clark Reynolds, and he is going to give us a very exciting announcement about our world missions offering that we took last week. Thank you, Christy. Good morning, everybody. I haven't even told you the announcement yet. That's great. I love it. Before I share the number, I want to tell you something that the Lord's doing through the life of our church. We had 2,100 givers to the world mission offering, more than 2,100 this year. So let's applaud that. That means... A lot of people giving to the work of ministry through this church, and 15% of those people had never given to the World Mission Offering before. So we've raised up some new givers to the work of missions at Houston's First. Yeah. If you remember, we had a goal of $2 million, and that's a pretty big goal. And I got to tell you, we didn't hit it. We beat it. Our total, and I think we have a slide here, was $2,075,000. So let's celebrate the work that the Lord is doing through Houston's First Baptist. Let's go to the Lord in a prayer of thanksgiving, shall we? Lord God, we thank you for who you are and how you've allowed us to be part of your great commission. Lord, you don't need us, but you have called us to be part of it. And it is an honor and a privilege to give sacrificially of our, of our uh, wealth, but also of our very lives to the mission of the Great Commission. And we thank you, Lord, for your provision. We thank you for what you're doing in and through the life of Houston's First Baptist Church. Lord, you do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever ask and imagine. And we just give this time to you. We thank you. We thank you for this day of worship. We thank you for this day of celebration. And we thank you, Lord, for what you are doing through Houston's First Baptist Church. Not to make us famous, Lord, but to spread the name of Jesus Christ. We love you and we give this time to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Clark. Can we just give the Lord a round of applause one more time for that? Praise the Lord. The impact that can have all around the world. 
sure in the name of Jesus. And in fact, in our worship, we want to do that right now. If you would stand back up with us, all that we have, laying it before the King. Sing this new song with us as we worship together.
are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out.
He's so worthy. He's so worthy of our praises. All that we have and all that we are. Just simply pour it out before him as his children, as his worshipers. Because he's worthy of nothing less. You be seated as we continue to worship together. I want the choir to come and our orchestra to lead us in this next song. It just simply speaks of his worthiness as our God.
you are the God of our praise. Lord, on that line, even in the waiting, we will praise and lift you high. Lord, our ways are not as high as your ways. Our thoughts are not as high as your thoughts. Who should know them, your word says. So, Lord, we trust in you. We praise you. We know no matter what our circumstances may or may not tell us, you are God and you are God alone and you're worthy of our praises. So we exalt you in this place this morning. We pray for our pastor in this moment, Lord, as you speak to us through him, through your word. We pray, Father God, Lord, you'll give us clarity. Lord, you give us listening ears and hearts that are open to receive the message that you have for us today. We trust you even in this moment, Lord. Have your way, have your will. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. What a joy. Welcome to our Siena, Cyprus, downtown campus as well, radio ministry, and those watching online, our digital family and Loop Campus. I want us to start our message out a little bit different today. I want us to celebrate for a second. So many great things going on in our church. We've already celebrated the World Mission Offering and reaching our goal with that, which is exciting. We have a ministry in our church. It's called Legacy 68.5. It's based on Psalm 68.5 that God will put the fatherless in homes with fathers, that he'll be able to connect those dots, all those things that it says in that verse. It's an amazing verse, but it's a ministry of our adoption, foster care, and kinship ministry. And I just want, I get such great news. I just want to celebrate it with you as a church all campuses to know the things that are going on. Show you a couple little pictures of some cute babies as well that you'll really like. This is Clark and Brianna Sanders and they're members of our church here at the Loop Campus. Yeah, let's cheer for that. And they are a valuable member of our, our team and we're so excited about them. And we have been able to give them a grant to adopt this little baby that she is holding in her arms right now. The child has been placed in the home you and I have been a part of that. We all often say, you don't give to the church, you give through the church. And so we're able to give money from you, from us being going to have matching funds as well to them as well. Hannah and Howard Solis um, are members of our Siena campus, and they've been able to expand their family from three to four with this little baby that's come into their home. Um, and we're so excited about this sweet baby boy coming into their home, which is such a blessing. Let's just celebrate that. Can we celebrate that, church? Let's cheer for that. So cool. Two more things I want to tell you. Michael and Danielle Obringer, um, they right now have been placed with two babies that are been adopted. They're going to adopt these babies. They've been placed with these two little ba baby boys, twin boys, and they're in the NICU right now. And so we as a church, we want to pray for them. We want to pray for those little babies. We want to pray for those boys. We want to pray also when we pray in just a minute, we want to pray for the birth moms of all of these little children too. We honor and respect them and birth dads as well to be able to just love them and then the last uh, couple that I want to introduce you to, Garrett and Heather Henson. They've been longtime members of Houston's First at our Cypress campus. And I'm going to actually ask them to come up here because they're here today. And they are right in the last uh, hours, I guess, days of finalizing um, a little baby to come into their home. And so we are so excited for y'all and so appreciate all that y'all are doing. And our church wants to give you a gift of $10,000 to help adopt that baby, to be able to do that. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. In church fun, guys? It's pretty cool. Pretty amazing. We love y'all, and we can't wait to have that little baby in our church and to watch him grow up here and just see the Lord um, do work in, in that little child's life. Hey, church, let's pray together. Father, we come in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord that you are able to do greater things than we can imagine, Father. This is just a, a, a snippet of all that you've done through this ministry in our church, Lord. And we're grateful for it. So we pray, Father, we lift up right now Heather and Garrett. And we just pray for them, God. And we ask you, Jesus, that you would just provide that, that right child at the right moment, the right time. Thank you that we can help them with such an expensive endeavor to help get this across the line, so to speak, and giving them this money, Father. We thank you for that. It's a joy. We pray, Father, for these two little boys in the NICU, Father. We pray believing in miracles, that even in this moment, we know that we could get a word back that you're not going to believe what happened when y'all prayed as a church. And so we just call out 
We ask you for healing. We ask you for, for you to do your work in those two baby boys' life. Lord, we thank you that they're a part of a loving home that loves and cares for you, Father. And we lift that up to you, Father. Thank you for our, all of our adoptive families, our foster families, kinship families, all that's going on, Lord. It's, it's a challenge, but Lord, it's a worthy calling. And so we lift it up and thank you that we get to be a part of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. You're welcome. Amen. Sure. Man, so good. What fun. I just want to celebrate with y'all and let y'all see the fun that we get to have of God doing his work and seeing some great things happen with children and senior adults all over our church. God's doing so many amazing things. Our world mission offering to be able to surpass that goal. Wow, all that money's going outside the doors of the church to reach people around the world, around the state, around the country. What a great thing. So we're going to jump into our message now. We're going to be into Mark, in Mark chapter 1, if you've got a Bible. Mark chapter 1, verse 35 is where we're going to start. If you don't have a Bible, that's a gift we'd like to give you. We'll give you a free Bible. We'd love to do that at any of our campuses. You just let us know, and we will jump in. We've got a thing we've been doing about every quarter. I'm doing a message that's within the theme more in 24, that we want more in 24. And I put there in your listening guide, if you'll grab this as well, right at the top, I've got what our more things are. I preached last quarter on more purpose and today's on more peace. Then we'll get to more passion. Then in the fall, more of my people. And I just felt in my heart like, it, you know, we just need more of the right things in our life. We need more purpose in our life, more engagement with the Bible and prayer. Today, more peace in our life because we're way too busy, as you'll see in a minute more passion, that we'd use our gifts and passions to serve the Lord and serve people and share our faith. And more of my people, meaning getting the people you love around you and getting to connect with your friends and family in that way. So as we talk about more peace, here's the, the statement, the clarity statement uh, that we'll put up there of more peace. Here's what it says, more peace, I'm too busy and will create margin and seek rest. You ready? We're gonna say that white sentence together on the count of three, because this is true. We're just gonna confess it. We're gonna say it. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. I'm too busy and will create margin and seek rest. One more time. I'm too busy and will create margin and seek rest. Now, you could be really busy as a grandparent trying to make it to all the games. You could be really busy as a new parent trying to change all the diapers. You could be really busy as a single adult trying to just get all the things with work and things going on. You'd be really busy as a kid going to all the practices and all the play practices and all the friendships and all of those sort of things. In school, we've got to understand that we are all way too busy. And we got to pull back to get real peace in our heart. And so I'm going to give you some real applicable things here of learning about this, uh, of real peace. You know, a, a fable was told, a man wrote a story of a, of a gentleman that came to America and was trying to learn English. And he stumbled upon his words, as you do if you're learning a new language. And he thought that the word busy meant good. Because everybody he would ask, how are you? They'd say, I'm busy. And he thought the word busy meant good. And that's actually very true. Research tells us that six in 10 adults feel too busy to enjoy life. That was in, in 2018. In 2023, it went to, it continued at 60%. Uh, don't feel like they have enough hours in the day to complete their to-do list. That means half of Americans, over half of Americans feel like they do not have enough time in the day. You know that Back in the day, once upon a time, leisure was the sign of your importance. You're like, man, that guy's really important. That lady's really important. They, they play golf twice a week. They do this, they do that. Now the sign of importance is actually your busyness. One researcher put it like this in the Harvard Business Re Review. He said, busyness has become a status symbol. People also consider those who exert high effort to be morally admirable regardless of their output. But I love what John Wooden, Wooden says, the famous UCLA basketball coach. He said, never mistake activity for achievement. So we're moving, we're going, we're making it happen. We're all over the place. And in that being all over the place, we get busy and busy and busy and we fill our time with all sorts of things. And in filling it, are we filling it with the right things? Are we walking with peace? Or are we just a hamster on the wheel? Look at Mark chapter one, 
verse 35, and I'll submit to you that no one could have been more busy than Jesus. There's a lot of people to heal, a lot of people to preach to. He just came off uh, of a lot of things happening at the beginning of, of Mark chapter one, of healings, all sorts of stuff. The crowds are pressing in. Look at Mark verse 35 of chapter one. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place. And there he was praying. Simon and his companions searched for him, and when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may come and preach there too. This is why I have come. The first thing about more peace, if you want more peace in your life, it requires individual effort. If you want more peace in your life, it requires individual effort. Did you see what happened there? He said, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, listen to the verbs, he got up, he went out, he made his way into a deserted place. It requires individual effort. It's not something that's just going to come to you. It's not something that's going to knock on your door. You're going to have to say, you know what? I'm going to take a step and I'm going to do something about this. I'm hearing the pastor talk about it. It's hitting my heart. I know this is me. I need to do something about this. Individual effort is what it's going to take. There is lots of grace in Christianity, but there's also some works in Christianity. And you got to do something about it. You got to see a need. You got to fill it. You got to see a, a weak spot in your life and you got to take a step forward. More peace requires individual effort. Let me break it down into two things to give us some application. Number one, find a time. Find a time. It gave us a time, very specifically there, very early in the morning while it was still dark. Very early in the morning while it was still dark, he got up in the morning by himself. Nobody else is around. Our intentions must turn to actions. Our intentions must turn to actions. I ask you this. How do you spend your mornings? What happens? What's the first thing you touch when you get up? Is it your phone? Is it your coffee maker? Is it your Bible? Is it your knees hit the ground? What is it? What's the first thing? And your Bible doesn't have to be the first thing, but is it in there somewhere? And so to be able to say, where's my time? Where is the time? Think about it in your life. Where is the time you spend time with God? Is it in the morning before you make it to work or to your day? Is it in the evening before you go to sleep? Somebody would always ask in college, they'd say, well, do you spend time with God in the morning? Do you spend time with the, eat God in the evening? I just decided if I do both, I'm going to grow twice as fast. So I spend time in the morning with God. I spend time in the evening with God. And, you know, because of my vocation, I spend time in the day with God. But I get up in each morning and I, I rarely miss, and that's no pride, that's need. That's not pride, that's humility. I, I get with God and I spend time in the morning. So in the mornings, I'm reading Ezekiel right now, and it's not really a lot of fun, I want you to know, but I want to get through Ezekiel. And so I'm reading that, and in the evening times, I read a part of the Gospels. And so I, that's, that's what I do, that's how I do it every single time. It's a witness to my kids because every morning they wake up and they see dad sitting in the same chair reading the same Bible praying and asking the Lord on their behalf as well. Do you have a set time? Personal responsibility is part of our clarity statement. Our personal responsibility in the clarity statement is, is I'm too busy and we'll create margin and seek rest. There's personal responsibility in that. And just by the way, our society and our country has lost personal responsibility. It's not always somebody else's fault. And parents, we've got to teach our kids this as well. It's personal responsibility. Do you have a time? Do you have a place? We'll get to in just a second. We live in a world that is adverse to personal responsibility, but we've got to find a time. You got 24 hours in a day. I got 24 hours in a day. Doesn't matter how much stuff or money or this or that you have, we all got 24 hours. How are we gonna spend it? How are we gonna spend it? What's our priorities? Number two, find a place. Jesus found a place very early in the morning while it was still dark. There's our time. He got up, okay, effort, went out, effort, and made his way to a deserted place. Now, this Greek word is the same word that's used for John in chapter 4 of this chapter, being in the wilderness. This is the same verse that, or same word that's used for Jesus being tempted when he was tempted by the enemy in the wilderness. Remember that? So this is a barren, deserted place. Place. Now, here's what I tell you this. If you're going to have peace, you're going to have to have a time with God, and you're going to have to find a place with God. Now, the place with God, as I told you, it's a certain chair, my, my 
home uh, study office that we have. I brought it up here on stage a few months back and showed it to you. It's a great chair. It's a great chair. I sit in that chair uh, unless I kind of just need a change and sit in another chair somewhere around the house. But I sit right there. That's my place. And that's a great thing. It's, a, it's not in front of, there's no TV in the room. There's no computer within grasp. There's really not even a window to look at that much. I mean, there's a window, but I can't really see much out of it. But I, I, that's my place. It's a deserted place, if you will where all I got is my journal, my Bible, our devotional, church-wide devotional guide. That's a great start for you. And to be able to have that. And so I'm going to gain peace before I jump into my day. It's a lot of appointments, a lot of stuff, a lot of things going on. I'm going to grab that peace and I'm going to go into it. Now, let's take it from that personal daily time and let's ask this question. Do you ever get some time that's just more extended time of peace? Extended time of peace. And when you find that place of extended time, here's what I want to submit to you. Your office and your home are not the place. Now, let me really mess with you now. A coffee shop is probably not going to be the place either. You need a deserted place. For years, I've had one of those fold-out chairs you can get from Academy for about five bucks in the back of my car, and I'll go to Memorial Park, and I'll pop it out, and I'll just sit there, and I'll read, and I'll enjoy a pretty day, awesome. You can go down to Galveston. You can sit on the beach for a day. You can go someplace else and you sit there and you enjoy and you let that happen as a rhythm of an undistracted place. Now, I I hate to tell you that your home and your office are not going to work. Why? Because you're hardwired for certain activities in those places. You ever find you walk into the kitchen, you're not even hungry. And what do you do? You open the refrigerator, right? It's just, just habit. You sit down on the couch, (sighs) ah, grab the remote. Why? Because that's your muscle memory. And so you want to get to a place that's a deserted place where you can get away. So here's what I do. I'll just tell you what I do. I've done this for years. I have days that I call time with the Father. I do it one day a month. And I have a day that I don't work in the ministry. I work on the ministry. And I get away. I go to a deserted place. I bring things I've been wanting to read. I bring studies I've been wanting to study. I don't work on the message for the week. I think about where we're going as a church for the month, for the year, for the semester. So right now, you can pray for me on it. I'm going to have one coming up, and I'm going to decide if the Lord gives me what we're going to teach and what we're going to do next fall. I'm working on that right now so that we can be ready for next fall. What books of the Bible does God want us to go through? Time with the Father. It is so important to me. I could not be your pastor without that time. I'm just going, going, going going and going. I can't do it. Let me ask you a convicting question. How many hours on your phone is necessary for you to accomplish God's will? How many hours is necessary on your phone to accomplish God's will? On average, cell phone users touch their phones, look at their phones 144 times a day. 57% of Americans consider themselves mobile phone addicts. Three in four, 75%, admit to feeling uncomfortable without their phones. Almost half, 47%, say they panic when their battery drops below 20%. Can you relate? Roughly teens average age of 13 to 27 say they spend way too much time on their phones. Yesterday, we went to a sporting event for, one of our, our, for our daughter, and I left my phone at home. I forgot my phone at home. It was awesome. And you know what? The world went on. How many hours a day does it take on your phone to accomplish God's will for your life? And are you using it to accomplish God's will? Are you using it to soothe your pain? To soothe whatever it is the need in your life? Now, hey, we're going to use our phones a lot. Our whole life is on our phone, pictures, emails, internet, shopping. I mean, I got one. I use it all the time. There's no doubt about it. It's just a part of you now. But I don't want it to be my life because it's not going to be able to replace Jesus for me. So do you take a Sabbath? Is today going to be a Sabbath for you? It's Sunday. Is it going to be a Sabbath for you? It's not going to be a Sabbath for me. This is working day for me, and I'm joyful to do it, but it's going to be a Sabbath for you. Are you going to spend this time, this day, as a Sabbath, or are you just going to race around? Start with an hour, move to a morning, make it a day, and take a weekend. Start with an hour, move to a morning, take a day, make it a weekend. Let the muscle memory and flexing become something a part of your life that you know how to rest. You know how to Sabbath. And I'm telling you, it's hard to learn. Give you an example. 
A famous experiment psychologist and his colleagues found that 67% of men and 25% of women, so this is men were worse, chose to press a button for an electrical shock to themselves rather than to sit with their own thoughts in a lab room. Did you hear that? They said, you sit in this lab room by yourself with your own thoughts. This button will give you an electrical shock if you get bored. I mean, I don't know how much it was. It probably wasn't that, you know. 67% of men could not sit with their own thoughts and had to press the button to shock themselves to get another rush. 25% of ladies. That's a problem. And I know, guys, here we go. But I, I was made to work, and I just, I don't know what I would do if I didn't work, and I'm not sure how, but that's a problem. That's a problem. That's a problem. If you don't know how to rest, you're going to burn out. Or if you don't burn out, you're going to miss some key relationships along the way in your life. I'm as type A and as driven as they get. And I've had to learn how to rest. Kelly will say to me sometimes, she will say this. Maybe it's a prayer. Maybe it's not even to me. She'll say, take the batteries out of the boy, is what she'll say. Because I'm that energizer bunny. I just want to keep hitting that drum. Keep going. Take the batteries out of the boy, is what she'll say. And she's right. I've had to learn that. So here's our action point. Our action point is, I need to blank, so I will blank. Lord, give me the strength. That's for you to fill out. I need to put my phone down. I need to take a day. I need to take a, a, a morning. Uh, Sienna, uh, Cypress, downtown. What do you need to put in that blank so that you will what? Rest, rejuvenate, revive. What does it need to be? Now, the second thing that I want to give you here as we move along, and I'll try to pick up the pace a little bit here, but more peace requires praying, not just playing. Let the conviction fall. More peace requires praying, not just playing. Well, I want to go on a cruise. Well, I want to go on a vacation. Well, we're going to go see uh, the fall foliage tour. We're going to go do this. We're going to do all that. Playing is awesome. We need that in our life. We need vacations in our life. We need to sightsee in our life. We need to go and do fun things. We need to be a part of that. But if you want to talk about peace, it's going to require praying, not just playing. And here's where we've deceived ourselves. We think that we just are going to go play and we're going to come back revived. Have you ever come back from a vacation needing a vacation? Have you ever just taken your type A, go get it, make an agenda, check the boxes, we're going to make this happen, and just shifted it to a vacation? Same thing you are at home, same thing you are at work, shump, and you just move it over here and you check all the boxes, and you get through it all, and finally at the end you go, well, we did that. Never going back there again. It was fun, but we're not doing that again. We're just boom, boom, boom. Praying, not playing, require, or begins the peace journey in your life. Verse 35, it's a rich verse. He made his way to a deserted place. We, pray, we, we talked about that. There he was praying, praying. Hear it, write it down in your notes. The peace of God is connected to the presence of God. The peace of God is connected to the presence of God. It's not connected to Carnival Cruise. It's not connected to a sporting event. It's not connected to a, to a wonderful, uh, you know, go see the sights. And I do all those and love all those and amen, clap, clap, clap. But the peace of God is connected to the presence of God. And all you need for that is a chair. And you got one of those. And you can spend time with the Lord. See, there's a difference in a day off and a Sabbath. There's a difference in fasting and just missing a meal because you were too busy. There's difference in soul refreshment and just physical refreshment. And we need all of those things in our life. Time with God is a keystone habit that affects every other habit in your life, every other habit in your life. I remember Kelly and I, uh, we bumped into some, some friends on vacation and we were talking and we were gonna do something together and then it came to like a campfire thing and I said, and we were kind of where they were, we weren't where we were. And I said, hey, does anybody have a Bible? And these are all believers. Nobody brought a Bible on vacation. I was like, none of y'all have your Bible. I mean, I'd say that, but that was what I was thinking. No, nobody here's got their Bible. And it was like, well, we're on vacation. That's the very best time in the world to have your Bible in your journal. 
Because you can get up when it's still dark of the morning and you can sit there and you can look at the beach and you can look at the mountains and you can look off that cruise boat. And you can look at those fall foliage. You can look at all those things and you can see the glory of God as you read through the Psalms and you write a note and your soul will be refreshed. Do you bring your Bible on vacation? Not your phone that has a Bible on it. I'm talking about paper and leather and highlighter pen and all that. And a journal. You have those. Those are part of your life. If not, there's not going to be peace in your life. When you talk about the peace of God, it's just not going to be there at the depth that you need it. So action point is this. I need more prayer, more Bible reading, more fellowship, or put in what you, you want to put in there. Circle your greatest need. What is it? This is a user-friendly message. You can put it in there, what you need in that spot. Number three, more peace requires realizing the same things will be there. More peace requires realizing the same things will be there. Look, if you will, in verse 36. Simon and his companions searched for him, that's Jesus, and when they found him, they said, everyone's looking for you. Here's the deal. Let me just give you some Bible. Do you know how much the disciples are gonna bug Jesus for these next few years? These guys are gonna be around all the time. We need bread, we need fish, we need this, we need that, we need all the time. Uh, they're gonna be all, and when I say bug, you know, of course, I mean that with due respect to the Bible. It's always gonna be there. Do you know that? Moms, do you know that, that you're gonna always have something to do? Dad, you're gonna always have something to do. Empty nesters, you're gonna have something to do too. There's gonna be always something to do on and on and on and on and on. There will always be a Simon knocking on your door saying, everyone needs you. Everyone needs you. They're all looking for you. Everyone needs you. They're all looking for you. Everyone needs you. They're all looking for you. It'll be at your door when you're old. It'll be at your door when you're young. Homework will knock on your door. Retirement will knock on your door. Empty nesting will knock on your door. Grief will knock on your door. All sorts of things are going to need you. Friends are going to need you over and over and over and over again. I remember hearing this illustration. You're juggling balls. Some of the balls are rubber and some of the balls are glass. Work is a rubber ball. If you drop it, it will bounce and it will come back up on Monday. Family is a glass ball. You drop it enough, it'll shatter on you. Relationships are a glass ball. You drop it enough, it'll shatter on you. Your marriage can be a glass ball. You drop it enough, it can shatter on you. Work will bounce. Email will bounce. Things to do will bounce. Mowing your yard will bounce. Having the house cleaned up will bounce. Doing some pre spring cleaning will bounce. All those things will bounce. There's some things that will shatter. And here Simon comes, and I just want us to hear this. When they found him, they had to look for him. They said, everyone is looking for you. Do you feel like everyone's looking for you? Everybody needs you. Everybody needs you. Sarah Groves, great song. Such a great song. I've quoted it to you before, but it just fits perfectly. It's called Just One More Thing. It says, there will never be an end. There will never be an end to the request, request upon your time. It's your place to stand up and tell the world you got to rest a while. And everything is important, but everything is not. And at the end of your life, your relationships are all you've got. And love to me is when you put down that one more thing and you say, I've got something better to do. And love to me is when you walk out on that one more thing and you say, nothing will come between me and you, not even one thing. Stereotypically, guys, when you say, work can wait, I wanna be with you, honey. That makes a difference in her heart. Stereotypically, ladies, when you say, the kids can wait, I want to be with you. Stereotypically, I'm just giving spectrums. That means something to him. And there's a moment in which we have to say, Love to me is when you put down that one more thing and say, I've got something better to do. I'm not doing email. I'm not answering the text. I'm not doing the this on my phone. I'm not doing the that. I got something better to do. See, more peace real, requires realizing the same things will be there over and over and over and over. Don't miss the important for the sake of the urgent. Don't miss the important for the sake of the urgent. And I just put you a bonus point in there on your listening guide. More peace requires recognizing I can't solve everyone's problems. Only Jesus can. I can't solve everyone's problems. Kelly and I say in our family, we got it from another family in our church here that says this, not my circus, not my tent. I can't solve everybody's problems. And not my circus, not my tent. Everything's not your responsibility. And so Jesus says, look, I'm spending some time with God. 
And Simon and the same friends and the same needy people and the same problems and the same needs are coming over and over and over. We have to acknowledge that we are limited, but God is not. We can't do it all, but God can. Our last point, our fourth point, our last one, more peace brings refreshment and purpose. More peace brings refreshment and purpose. Let's see where we see that in the scriptures. Verse 38, listen, Cyprus and Siena and digital family downtown. And as he said to them, let's go on to the next neighboring villages, to the neighboring villages, so that I may preach there too. That is why I've come. Do you see refreshment and purpose? He's had a huge day before of all these healings. He wakes up early in the morning, could have slept late, would have just been just fine. That's got a good place too. But he wakes up early in the morning. He spends time with God. He spends time in prayer. And then he steps out and he says, all right, they came, they knocked on the door, they interrupted, so to speak. He says to them, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I've come. He is refreshed. I love that phrase, let's go. You find that's like the big sports phrase right now. Let's go, right? Everybody's, let's go. It's so interesting to me too. You just watch this. That excitement today in sports looks a whole lot like anger. Watch. Watch when somebody's fired. Let's go. They are, it's like there's so much anger in us as humans. It's coming out now in our form of excitement. It's the weirdest thing. Watch it. Watch it happen. And let's go. Jesus didn't scream it angry. He said, let's go. Let's go. I'm on a mission from God. I'm the son of God, God in the flesh, and let's go. Where are we going? We're going to the next village. We're going to the neighboring village. We got people to reach over there. I'm gonna preach. You guys want me to heal all the time, but my number one thing is preaching the gospel that the good news has come that God can save through me, basically, Jesus Christ saying that. And he says, let's go and let's go to the next place. Now look at the purpose at the end. Can you say this about your life? This is why I've come. Do you know your purpose? Do you have anything that you say, this is why I've come. This is what I was made for. I, I spoke at something just recently and I was driving back and Kelly said, how'd it go? And I said, I don't know. I just feel like I was made for this. I was just made for this. Not like, oh, it was such a great message. I'm so amazing. No, in that moment, that's why, I'm, that's why I, I came. He invited me, I came, I, I spoke and I was made for this. Do you know why you've come? Or do you just frolic? And activity is just what you do. You just do, 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 do. You've come for the people in your family. You've come for the friends. You've come for your workplace. You've come for the difference that you'll make in people's lives. And if you just, if you see those glass balls and you go, this is, this is an important one. This other one's gonna bounce, but this one's gonna break. I've come for this. And these other things as well, sure. But I've come for this and I've gotta hold this carefully. Jesus, in that moment, I love how it wraps up. Look at the progression. He wakes up early in the morning after a big day. He goes out to a deserted place. He spends time with God. Everybody comes beating on the door. They still need him. We all are needed. It's great to be needed. It's wonderful to be needed. It's it's awesome to be needed. You need to be needed. But he's refreshed now, so he steps out and he says, let's go. Let's go. And let's go make a difference in the next neighboring village. The next thing that God gives us, let's make a difference right there and let's walk it out and go for it in that. The people wanted more miracles, but Jesus intended to preach. He decided, hear this, hear this, hear this, hear this. He decided he was gonna please God instead of man. And it made all the difference in his life, son of God, to die on the cross for us, sinless, absolutely amazing. So, more in 24. Will we go for it? Book Essentialism puts it like this. The American dream is the undisciplined pursuit of more. The way of essentialist is the disciplined pursuit of less. Will you live in the undisciplined pursuit of more or will you live in the disciplined pursuit of less of things that are valuable, more valuable than anything? Now, let me just say, We've all made mistakes. There's grace. There's so much grace. It's okay. Today's a new day. Let's live differently. God can make it through your mistakes. He can handle all those things and he can take care of all those things. But if we're gonna have more in 24, one of the things we need more of is peace because we are so, so busy, busy, even doing church stuff. So the last thing that you have in your listening guide 
for you to fill out, you can think about is this, Lord, I hear you saying blank. I hear you saying blank. What is it you need to put in there? Let me have us repeat one more time if I can. Our clarity statement, our word to just say it out loud. I want you to say this with me. Cypress, Siena, downtown, everybody all together. We're gonna say it, one, two, three. I need more peace. I'm too busy and will create margin and seek rest. Say it one more time. I need more peace. I'm too busy and will create margin and seek rest. Father, we come in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, that if we're gonna have more in 24, if we're gonna really walk in your ways and these ways, we tell you, Lord, we need you, God. And we pray that we would be a people that wouldn't just be hurried, but we'd be people that could rest. And that through that, we'd find our peace, we'd find our purpose, we'd know why we've come, and we'd live with you. Let it begin with this very Sunday. Will today be a day of rest? Or will it just be evaporated, this message gone in a couple hours? Will our Bibles get open this week, Lord? Will our journals get written in? Will our knees get soiled from prayer? Or will we just swipe and click and watch other, other people's lives? We need you, God. This is a hard one for us. For some reason, and we'd rather shock ourselves than sit alone with our thoughts. Take just a moment, pray and say, Lord, I heard you. I need you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, if you will. We're gonna worship with a song, just our need for God. We've got folks that are down front, folks in the cross aisle, folks in the balcony. They'd love to pray with you about your frantic, hectic pace, if that's what it is, or about how to receive Christ as your Savior, or join the church, or get your life right with the Lord, or anything you need prayer on. They're here for you. Let's worship the Lord, and let's respond to Him. Lord, I need
Thank you all so much for joining us this week and we really have loved having you here and we want to continue to be able to connect with you throughout the week um, and moving forward as well. And so there's ways for us to be able to do that. If you have anything that you want us to be praying over or to get you plugged in more with the church, you can text prayer to 44322 and that's just a way for us to be able to reach out to you and for you to feel more connected within the church. So you can follow us on social media by subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, going to Instagram as well as on Facebook too. And this just gives you an opportunity to continue through messages, hearing testimonies and so many other things. And so we want to be here for you in whatever way we can. We hope that you have an amazing week and we look forward to seeing you very soon.